Sports Committee has thrown out a promotion this entry called performance anxiety dreams. But among modern lawyers, there's a dream that's almost universal. Folks, uh, four different groups, Texas Rangers, LAPD SWAT, a uh, Marine Battalion back from Belusia, a Special Forces Battalion back from the Bay of Afghanistan. And all four cases, ask them how many ever had the dream? Every single hand goes up. The more elite the unit, the more common it is. The more danger they're in, the more common it is. The average law enforcement audience, over 90% will have had the dream. What is the dream? They're all have Some version of gun don't work. Bullets troop out the barrel, bullets bounce off the back of bullets have no effect. Can't find a gun, can't drop a gun. Hundred pound trigger pull. A hunky gun goes to gun. I gave days with the triple. This is a very unique and valuable audience. Give me a, a data shot back. How many people in this room have ever had some version of the gun doesn't work for you? Yeah, look around you folks. For those who go in harm's way, the dream is virtually universal. Now, I'll tell you what the dream means. The sports community calls it a performance saying something for you. Now, if you were a football coach, and your star receivers have enough dream. Very common pro ball dream. Coach, your star receivers have enough fumble dream. That's right. What are you going to do? Retention drills, retention drills. Stick up the ball, take his area of concern, turn it into area of confidence. You have having a gun that's a work dream, what do you need to do? Go to the range. Do some training. What the puppy's trying to get with that dream, what the puppy's trying to say with that dream, in three words. Piss on ball. <laughs> puppy says, boss, I'm worried. Let's go train. Listen to that puppy, folks. Listen to that puppy. Well, you know, in the, the final half hour, I want to talk about the great destroyers in the years after that. When we're old and weary, there appear to be a couple things that weigh upon me. Starting in 1988, I began interviewing World War II vets and Vietnam vets by the hundreds, present whole reunions, conduct surveys. And whenever I worked with these World War II vets, these Vietnam vets, they specifically told me, many, many of them, what I'm about to tell you is the most vital thing you're going to hear. That these World War II vets, these Vietnam vets, said this is one of the most important things I had to give them. Is it worth five minutes of our time? What do you think? I think it would be so. Thou shalt not kill, question mark. Now folks, remember I told you we study people who do not get PTSD, all like cost survivors and POWs? And one of the things I mentioned over and over again was their faith was a vital component in resiliency. How do you suppose we justify chaplains in this day and age? If you're not wired that way, it's other ways to skin that cat. But at the moment or two, do not neglect your faith is a vital component in resiliency. And all your life on movies and television, you've seen somebody waving a black book and shouting, thou shalt not kill. If that's all you know, and you have to kill somebody, they kick your tail. If you think even a little bit, you might be going to hell for the lawful use of deadly force that is not conducive to good mental health. Now may I ask you a question, think about it. It's World War II, and we killed millions of the enemy in World War II. And the world would be a dark and desperate place today if we had fought and won in that war, yes? I want you to think about this. Were all of our religious leaders a bunch of hypocrites? Before the war, did all of our pastors and priests and ministers and rabbis and chaplains, did they all preach, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill the war began? They all said, that would change your mind, kill those guys. It's war. Oh. That's not what happened. 99% of the Judeo Christian ethos for the last 5,000 years have believed the proper translation, the proper adaptation, you shall not murder. Again, this is in our combat starting on page 350, it works through all of those. And, 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 and folks, all the modern trend, all the Jewish translation, the original Hebrew translates it shall not murder. Almost all the modern translations translate it shall not murder. Now, folks, thou shalt not kill came with the King James Bible came out here 1611, 400 years ago. 
Want to stick with a 40 year old translation? Go in the King James to, uh, to uh, uh, Matthew 19 18. Try to turn the Greek in their precise language. Jesus is running through the commandments, and Jesus says, Thou shalt do no murder. In your mind, is there a difference between what Jennifer Fulford did, going to the garage and killing those two home invaders to save her life and save those kids' lives? Is there a difference between what Jennifer did, what the terrorists did in that school in Russia? Can we agree there's all the difference in the world? One's a lawful use of deadly force to protect innocent lives. The other's a mass murder of children. And if you can tell the difference, maybe God can too. If there is a God, if he's God of the Bible, it says so over and over again. Again, it's all covered in our combat. Ultimately, Jesus said it best. Greater love is no one than this, that they get their right to their friends. And the men and women who put their life on the line to protect the innocent have never received anything but the highest honor from 99% of the judeo christian egos for the last 5,000 years. So you may not need all that religious stuff. Everybody's got a Bible somewhere. Tab a few verses up so we get the head right. Ain't got a Bible? Steal one for the next old job we're going to Folks, uh, again, along that line, my most recent book is Both Group Marriage. It's a 90 day devotional. Sheep, dog, and spouse. And uh, that taps into that dynamic if you're wired in that direction. I recommend it to you. So, World War II, Vietnam. That whole thou shalt not kill thing was a pretty big deal to them. But most of them were 18-year-old kids, drafted off the street, a few short months later, and were some guy got a lot. For a lot of those kids, killing was hard. But I am convinced from a lifetime of study, if you properly prepare yourself, it's just not that big a deal. For a mature individual who's prepared themselves by God and Spirit for a lifetime, for a mature individual who's using deadly force to save lives. You save your own life, something called survivor euphoria. Feel good about it. A lot of people feel bad, they don't feel bad. Folks, I, uh, LAPD brought me up to do detective in-service day. LAPD detective in-service day was, was 600 people. A seasonal female LAPD detective came up. She said, she said, you're the first one in 20 years to tell me it's okay to not feel bad about killing that guy. So there's no wrong way to respond to killing this. Many good people respond and they're all okay. I think if you could choose how you respond to it, you'd want to feel good about it. The satisfaction of hitting the target in a life and death event, the fact that you saved people's lives, you stopped the deadly force threat, you saved your life, you'll feel good. So a lot of people feel better than feel bad. But I, I, I tell you how many of our veterans have come up to me in 18 years of war, and this war and said, uh, they said, I got no problem killing the bad guy this war, and I believe them. They are absolutely fine. They have no problem killing the enemy in this war. I had to leave some friends over there. I got let go of them. And that's the hard part. Survivor so guilt. I'm old and weary, filled with the question, why me? Why am I alive and they're dead? So folks, here it is right up front, very important. Survivor guilt is not PTSD. It's grieving, it's loss, it's hard, but it's normal. In the normal cycle of life, we will all bury our parents. Is there anything more normal that parents have died before their children? Yes, it's normal, but it's hard. And most people's lives, one of the hardest things we'll ever do, is it bury your parents? And, 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 and folks, does that destroy us? I think we're a little bit wiser people who understand how precious every minute can be after we've lost our parents. But our parents want to be destroyed with that? No. And in these violent times, has there anything more normal than some of our fellow sheepdogs would lay their life down? Would, would they want us to be destroyed by that? No. And I want you to understand something really important here, folks. The DSM, the Bible of Psychiatry, Psychology says, whenever the cause of your trauma is human in nature, the degree of trauma is usually more severe and more lasting. 
You tell me now, is there a difference between these two scenarios? Scenario one, a tornado hits a house while you're gone, puts your family in the hospital. How do you feel about that one? Thank God they're alive, yeah? Scenario two, a gang breaks into the house while you're gone and systematically beats your family into a hospital stay. How do you feel about that one? Can we agree there's all the difference in the world? One's an act of nature, the other's an intentional malignant act by human being. That's why one serial killer can paralyze the city. A 9-11, the, the, the terrorists murdered 3,000 citizens. The stock market crashed or we left changed forever. That same year, 30,000 Americans died in traffic accidents. Didn't change nothing, they were accidents. When a human being inflicts that trauma, that is why terrorists coming to daycares, elementary schools, more often, could destroy our way of life and life we could never imagine. And so I need you to understand how toxic, how corrosive interpersonal human aggression could be. Do you think the firefighter prepares for the fire, the diver prepares for the sea, the pilot prepares for the sky, how much more so to we prepare for that toxic realm called combat? And that's my book on combat, and that's the concept. But folks, if it is so toxic, if it is so corrosive, why do we do it? That others need not. That our children need not. I think if you understand how corrosive and destructive human aggression can be, then you understand the beauty and the power of those who go in harm's way that others need not. And, 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 and folks, among those who go in harm's way together, there is a bond of love that other people can't understand. Shakespeare wrote about it. He says, we are warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful fields, but by the mass, our hearts are in the trim. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers and I had sisters. For he or she today that says of love of me shall be my brother, shall be my sister. Be they ne'er so vile this day shall gentle their condition. And gentlemen at home now of head shall count themselves accursed, and hold their manhood's chief was in his feet that fought with us upon this day. That is the bond of love among those who go in harm's way together. And when someone steals that life away, it can be hard. And there's two ways we can spin out of control. One is inappropriate aggression for others. Two, is inappropriate aggression towards yourself. And now at the end of the day, we put two last pieces of open wine in place. Justice on vengeance, and life not death. And justice on vengeance simply says this, you have sworn a solemn oath to justice, vengeance will destroy us. All the Israeli research, all the military research, all the law enforcement research tells us this one actually cannot live with. And remember, PTSD truly can be the gift that keeps on giving. The one act most likely to destroy us and our loved ones is to commit a violent criminal act. Wherever we think we're avenging, whatever we think we're accomplishing, it's not worth the price ourselves, our spouse, our children. And you know, there was a time in this war, training the troops to go back and forth, there was a time when they talked a lot about Abu Ghraib. Remember that prison I read? Remember those photographs? Folks, that happened over a decade and a half ago. A generation don't remember that one. Good, that, let's forget that one and move on. But early in the war in Iraq, some American troops have used Iraqi prisoners for photographs. Those photographs appeared on the cover of newspapers and magazines around the world. Back in those days, a very young soldier called them the seven idiots who lost the war for us. We lost that war. They're still hanging in there. But the seven fools in that prison did us more harm that every terrorist put together on that day when those photographs appeared in newspapers and magazines around the world. So listen, in a lifetime of virtuous, honorable service, police, armed citizens, you can do enormous good. But in one moment of stupidity, we can do more harm than every criminal American put together on this day. You let me know, throughout the line, let me know. You want to play this game by the rules? Then get to hell out of our bed. There's too much at stake to lose it all because of what he did. By the way, it is now a nationally televised game. You don't have to like it, you've got to accept it. Every single thing you do will be caught on camera. 
in YouTube and, and CNN forever and ever on them. But we gotta win this game by the rules. People say the bad guy don't make the rules, what's the answer? That's why he's the bad guy. That's where we all get together. We hunt him down like a dog. We fill him full of holes. We shove him in a cage like an animal because he won't play by the rules. If we don't want to play by the rules, he's got a cage for us too, yes? And remember I told you your score of solemn oath to justice and authenticity. Some of you said, no, David, I'm not a cop. I never swore that oath. Yes, it did. There's an old rule, the deeper oath, an oath we swore from my youngest days. An oath that says everything it means to be an American. And we reminded that oath. You stay seated. Help me out at the key point. Y'all don't win. Stay seated. Help me out at the key point. It went like this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. We do not violate an oath we took from our youngest days without being a terrible So you yourself right now, whoever think of avenging, what I think of accomplishing, it's not worth the price myself, my spouse, my children, everything, my family, that's a property not important. They can be harmed in one moment or stupid. You know, a little while back, they brought me out to L.A. to talk about big boxing lights. A couple thousand people, a big arena, a couple hours in the middle side of the game, boxing. They had a meet and greet afterwards. A whole bunch of people there eating all kinds of good food and talking. And they introduced me to young boxer, future world champion, 20 fights, undefeated. He's got family there, he's got mom there with him. Out of nowhere, this kid looks at me and says, what do you think? about justice versus vengeance. Uh, I never mentioned that topic. You must have read my book. I just told him very constantly, vengeance will destroy you. He said, what if justice is not doing the job? And look at this kid. Look, mom, mom's on the edge of tears here. This kid's talking crazy talk. This kid is going to do something to destroy everything he's ever had. I look back at him and say, yeah, man, you swore an oath to justice from the younger states. What? Yeah, you swore an oath. A pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, and he said, justice for, he said, oh. I said, you do not violate that oath you took from a young state without paying a terrible price. And he said that back, word for word. And here's mom, he even a sigh of relief. I could see mom. Finally, somebody can talk sense to this thing. I think there is great power. And reminding people that oath. I think if the day ever comes, our kids don't say that oath, it'll be a sad day. So we dedicate ourselves to justice and vengeance and life not death. And life not death simply says, if I give my life to save your life, don't you dare waste it. Think now while you're calm and rational. Think. If you are going to die and, and your loved ones and comrades are getting on my life, you're dead. Everybody you care about is getting on with their lives. What do you want for them? What do you want for your loved ones after you're gone? Happiness and joy. The fullest, richest, best life they can have. That's what you lived and fought and died to give them. Now, if they're the ones that died and you're driving on their death, you're getting on with life. What, what, what do they want for you? The same thing. The fullest, richest, best life you can have. That means right now, dedicate yourself to that life that will buy at such a price. To crack the bones and suck the marrow from every day they're blessed with. And right now, confront the possibility of suicide, chew it up and spit out. So suicide, yeah, where did that come from? I never heard my gun. Folks, the average cop is far more likely to die from their own head than they are from criminals. Every year, we lose more of our troops to suicide than we do to the young man. Now, they all would have said, I'll never eat my gun. They made a bad decision, they made a to rethink it. So can we all agree on one thing? I think every living creature can agree on one thing. Nobody takes your life without a fight. Give me a see and head nods on that one. Every living creature can agree, see and head nods, nobody takes your life, including you, without a fight. Tell yourself right now, I will fight for my life. I will seek counsel. I will get medication. I will leave no rock unturned. I will fight for my life like we're fight for my child's life. But no one takes my life, including me, without a fight. Burned in your soul, I will fight for my life. 
I will seek counseling. I will get medication. I will leave no rock unturned. I will fight for my life like I would fight for my child's life. That's all it takes my life, including me. Not a fight. Heard it in your soul the moment of truth, your warrior's spirit. will guide you through. And we wrap up the day we'll come full cycle with this photograph again. And I want you to look at it with fresh eyes and understand what's going on here. Now, he's on his second trip down to the World Trade Center. He's a giant of a man. He's virtually carrying a pregnant woman down. Uh, he's getting enough. And, and obviously, he's got that, that incredible, vivid example of that, the basal constriction. Now, what do we know about him? Is the blood fully drains from the face, the blood drains from the foreground, and there is no rash on top of that man's head. Can you accept that? Remember that? We'll come back to that. His name is Christopher Amoroso. Amoroso, remember that. But this point on that awful day, the smoke and the flames are so intense, they're leaping from those buildings in waves. The people there tell me the media never properly captured it. They were coming down from all towers. They were coming down from all four sides. Strangers holding their hands on the way down. Comforting one another in the awful final seconds. It takes a long time to die for 94 or so. Every second is filled with despair. The sky behind them is filled with fallen bodies. The air above them is filled with smoke and flames. And the awful sound of those bodies hitting the sidewalk. Smack, 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 like somebody clapping their hands. It's echoing his ears. Now, have you understand why looks like that? What, what, what makes him different from her? What's he going to do that she's not? He's going back. Now, do you understand there is no rational problem that man's head? Do you understand nobody told him go? People tried to stop him from going. He'd been cut, he'd been burned, his eyes are rolled up in his head, he's exhausted. People grabbed hold of him and tried to stop him, and he shrugged them off. And like a, a mother who goes in a burning building to save a beloved child. Christopher Amoroso wrote that building a third time. The building will fall, and he will not come home as wife and baby tonight. He'll never come home again. So why does one person go up the steps again and again while thousands are coming down? Because he's a sheep. Huh? Because that's what he's trained to do. The foreground shuts down, the midbrain takes over, your product and your instincts, your training, all this too. But I want to give you the scientific solution to the question. Why will men and women die? Think about it. How do you get someone to die? You can't order someone to die. What do you do? Kill me if I don't do it. Well, no one is watching. In the heart of darkness, in the midnight of our soul, but no one will ever know. When everyone's telling you not to go, why? Well, some people go towards their death, is what we know. And nature, the one place for the powerful natural instinct to self-preservation, is canceled out across many different species, can be seen in a mama critter. Across many different species, a mama critter will die from one thing. What is it? Her children, the young children. In combat, we know if we throw a bunch of strangers front lines together, Men and women don't know each other, don't care about each other. As soon as it's dark, as soon as people are dying, they're out of there. You put together a band of brothers and sisters, men and women who know and trust one another, they'll fight long and hard. Why? For each other. Audie Murphy is the most decorated American soldier in World War II. Audie Murphy is asked one time why he did it. His answer was very simple. They were killing my friends. They were killing my friends. All this research revolves on one word. Now at the end of the day, I want to pull that word out and embrace it. There's a book called The Gates of Fire about the Spartans of Thermopylae. Very good. Marine Corps Commandant's required reading, Gates of Fire. A little place called Thermopylae in Greece, 2,500 years ago. I've been there. It's a little building. It's burned some bridge and fire miles. But not much there. It's a nice statue, and there's, there's an incredibly steep hillside with amazingly thick brush. And then it levels off at the narrowest point, maybe a little over 100 meters, and drops down where the ocean used to be 2,500 years ago. And you stand there and you realize 2,500 years ago, Western civilization was about to be destroyed. 
The Persian army, a hundred thousand strong, was coming around that corner. And a small Greek army, from about around 300 Spartans, stood in their way. The commander of the Persian forces walked up and said, You don't understand. There's so many of us, we fire our arrows. It darkens the sky. But all Spartan army said, Good, we're going to fight in the shade. <laughs> By the end of the second day, they're still holding. Some dead, some wounded, still holding after two days. The commander of the Persian forces walked around and said, We honor you. Never in history has so few men held up an army. We will give you a place of honor in our army. We will protect your weapons. Just hand over your weapons. The Spartan king said two words. Well, I'm not me. Come and take them. On the third day, the tide tore back. And it poses a question at the beginning of the book. What is the opposite of love? What, what is the opposite of fear? What quenches fear as water quenches fire? The answer, love quenches fear, water quenches fire. The one force of this planet stronger than the instinct of self-preservation. The mama critter loves her baby more than life itself. Audie Murphy loved his fellow school, soldiers more than life itself. And Christopher Amorosa, he loves his fellow citizens, men and women trapped in those towers, men and women he's never met more than life itself. Now here's the crazy part, folks. The mama critter will die to save her babies. She won't die for nobody else's babies. We're seeing the sheep on kids' book. The sheep will die to protect the ones that love. Only the sheep die. Love's enough to die for other people's loved ones. Only the sheep die. Love's enough to die for other people's loved ones. You believe in who you are. You believe in what you do. For greater love hath no one than this. And we were not given a spirit of fear, but of love. Here's the crazy part, folks. Absolutely blows me away. I used this photograph of Christopher Amoroso with permission for the first decade after 9 11. So somebody told me the name Amoroso means. Amor is love. Amoroso is the lover. One who loves. But we wrap up the Sheepdog Kids book by saying they're not heroes because they die. They're heroes because they walk out the door every day prepared to lay down their life. There are many ways to give your life. Sometimes the greatest love is not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. To prepare for a lifetime for the one desperate day that may never come. To sacrifice your time and your resources, and to go out that door every day of your life to the utmost of your ability, to the best of your ability. Sometimes, the greatest love is not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. So I'll wrap up the day with one last model for action. There have been other dark moments, other Americans asked to make a stand on it. I tell you things are crazy to add, and what's worse of all, people don't even know it. I showed you the data. Two years straight, the homicide rate exploded like nothing we have seen in the history of our nation, and it stayed here another year. Gang crime and gang membership exploded. Five dead cops in Dallas is a high score that two million gang beggars want to be. The single worst year over year increase in cops murder. And Latin America is a howling war zone coming across the border like a freight train. And the people hitters of 9 11 are still out there. With all their heart and all their might, they want to hurt us. So many pigeons are coming home to roost, it darkens the sky. Good. We're going to fight the shade. There were other dark hours. Other Americans asked to make a stand. December 1944, World War II, the Battle of the Bulge. The Nazis had shattered an entire portion of the American lines. The German army units were cutting deep into our rear. Their goal was to cut back and capture the one fully functional deep water port we had in Northern Europe. If the Nazis cut back and captured that port, they would cut off our supply lines. Millions of Allied troops would be trapped without food, without fuel, without ammo, the fate of the world hung in the balance. The paratroopers, the 82nd, 101st Airborne Division, pulled out of reserve. 
and they marched day and night to form locking positions on the little roads coming out of the Urgens forest. And those young, elite, legend-equipped airborne troops, they had the authority and the responsibility and the mission to rally together the fleeing Americans and to stop the Nazi advance, and that's exactly what they did. A, a photographer there captured the moment. An American tank is fleeing down the road, 30 tons of death running with the Nazis on his heels. One young paratrooper standing beside the road. He's got hollow sunken eyes and greenish both appear. He's got a bazooka slumber back there right by his side. Walked out with a small helmet in his hand and stopped the tank. He said, hey buddy, are you looking for a safe place? The guy said, yeah. He said, then park your tank behind me. Because <laughs> I'm the airborne, and this is as far as the faster to go. Do you understand how this story applies to you? For the rest of your lives, you will be faced with people fleeing. They're fleeing gangs and drugs, crime and violence, terrorism, and the fear that lurks in the hearts of every man, woman, and child. And you have the authority and the responsibility and the mission to stand up as a friend. Neighbor, brother, sister, are you looking for a safe place? They'll tell you, yeah, oh yeah, you tell them, you tell them, then get behind me. Because I am a cop, I am an armed American citizen, endowed by my creator with inalienable rights, empowered by my constitution to keep and bear arms, inspired by my forefathers to fight for this land I love. I am an armed American citizen, and this is as far as the bastard to go on. And as you do that for the rest of your lives, may God bless you, your family, your family, your family. and God bless America. Thank you. Cool. Presented before I did, 
reason why he talks a lot longer than I'm going to is because mindset is the most important part of this program. It's the most important part of keeping the kids safe. The guns get all the attention because they're controversial and everybody gets all wrapped around and emotional. Mindset is really what matters. It, it is the most important thing. When we started in Ohio, the first thing we did was we had Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman come chat with school staff. It was the seeds from that day that got us to where we are today. It's the seeds from today with you as the disciples going and spreading the word on what you've heard here today that will make your state, your schools, your kids, your community, our country safe. The Spetsnaz have a say. If not me, then who? The Spetsnaz and Russian Special Forces. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? If not me, then who? If not now, then when? If I'm not going to do something to make my school safe, who is? If, I, if we're not going to do it now, when are we going to? So, the origins of Faster is back after Sandy Hook. My group, Buckeye Firearms Association, is invited to a town hall meeting where, just like after Texas and Dayton and Parkland and multiple others all across the country, we have these forums. And the guy who's doing them, Ken Hansen, says, I hate these things. I said, Why? I'm really good at it. He said, Because they're all the same. We see our talking points, they say our they're talking points, but nobody really cares about the dead kids. Because nobody ever does anything. We come back and repeat the same show after every mass killing. I said, Oh, why is that? What do you want to do? He goes, Can we hire John Better at Tactical Defense Institute to teach a class of teachers to carry a gun and save the kids? I'm like, Well, I don't know if we did. Can you even carry a gun in a school? Ken was like, Turning, he goes, I'll be back to my office in about 20 minutes. I think so. I'll check. I called Mr. Better and he wants stuff up. Mr. Benner said he's already got the class, 24 people, we can announce it on TV. Ken says, yep, school board has full authority, they can do whatever they want. So we announced this class, there were gasps, oh my God. The media mocked us. He said, do you think 24 teachers, teachers don't want to carry guns, do you think you only get 24 people sign up for your class? So I don't know, we're going to find out. In three weeks, we had about a thousand people sign up for that class. So the bookmarks on who we had, I, I went through that thousand people and picked the 24 people for that first class. And the range on the bookmark, I had one guy saying, look, I was a law enforcement officer for 10 years. I've transitioned to teaching. I maintain my accreditation. I carry a gun in every place I go, except in the school to protect the kids. Said, well, who thinks that? He said, you're in the class. On the other end, I had a woman say, I've never fired a gun. I don't like guns, I'm afraid of guns. My friends tell me I'm anti-gun. But I will consider anything to keep my kids safe. Can you help me? So I called her up and we talked. She decided this was not for her. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But she changed my life because she opened my eyes to how much our school staff love our kids. I didn't understand that. And she taught me that with her passion and her fear on how important this was for her. She is willing to face a primal fear for somebody else's kids. Victoria Soto stood in front of, in front of a fire in the yard with his kids in San Diego. Coach Price died in the parking lot. We see it over and over and over again. We know the goose will die for its goslings, but the cat will not die for another cat's kittens. But our school staff will die, not just for their kids, but for mine. How can I not be touched and motivated by that? So we did the first class. It went way better than we ever thought it would. It was a logistical nightmare because the price of oil doubled and there were all kinds of problems. But we finished that first class, and that was all I was supposed to be as a one and done. 
But I couldn't train 24 out of 1,000 people and go, huh. I'm so proud of myself, done with that job. We had a bunch more money to do it, and we had a bunch of donations come in and said, look, if you're going to actually do something that can save a kid's life, I'll donate to that. So we changed things around a bit, did a couple more classes, and, and it evolved. Uh, it, there was never a plan for any of this program, but it evolved through this stuff. And today, in the last seven years, we've trained approximately 2,000 people in 250 districts and 20 states. Volunteers raised, has raised and spent over a million dollars just to train our school staff and law enforcement on this stuff. It is absolutely the coolest thing in the world I have ever been involved with outside of raising my own kids. There is nothing that comes close. I'm an airline pilot. I would give this up a heartbeat if I didn't even like doing it. Uh, I do this as a volunteer because if I have somebody else going to die for my kids, when I can't spend a day to go help somebody else understand stuff, understand what. Rosen teaches. So the program, in a nutshell, is mindset, shooting, tactics, and medical. As I tell the school staff, if, if you want to solve a problem, how about we start by understanding it? How about we study it? We've had a couple hundred of them. Is there any lessons we can learn here? And the answers are yeah. There's a lot. So, and when I talk to school sports, one of the things I tell them is, look, I'm an airline pilot. We train in simulators. Sometimes the simulators aren't comfortable. Sometimes it's awkward. But in this discussion, we're going to be frank and we're going to be honest. Because the dead children and the family members deserve that. We're going to use the proper words. We're not going to call them shooters. We're going to call them killers. We're going to call them cowards. We're going to talk about the massacre, all the stuff that Colonel Grossman started at the beginning. And that makes people uncomfortable. Some people are really, really averse to violence. They're averse to death. They're averse to talking about it. So we make up other words about stuff, and we sanitize things, because they make people uncomfortable. And so I tell right off the bat, look, it may get uncomfortable. But just like me walking out of the city right here, and my 200 people behind me are safer because of what I've gone through. My goal is when you come out of here, is the, the 2,000 people in your school are safer because you're going to learn and understand some of this stuff. Because I've got to be able to develop a rapport and work with them. So the other thing I told them is, let's talk honestly about your schools. The vast majority of people in the school want nothing to do with carrying a gun. Like, if you don't want those people carrying guns, they're like, no, we don't. Like, we don't want to train them. We're all on the same page. I'm like, wait a minute. I thought you were here to talk about training our school staff. I'm like, the vast majority of them know. The, most people don't want to go through this. There's nothing wrong with the school teacher who doesn't want to carry a gun and shoot somebody down in front of our kids. Nothing wrong with her. Nothing wrong with him. There's a lot of right about somebody who doesn't want to kill someone with a gun. I'm like, okay. I'm like, but the other truth you have to realize is in every one of your buildings, you have a Victoria Son. You've got a Coach Vice. You've got an employee who's going to go to that senior event day. No matter what your policies are, no matter what the risk to their own life is, they're going to go there and they're going to do every single thing they can to help those kids because they love them that much. They love them more than their own life. Like, yeah, yeah, we, we've got to work with you like that. And I say, here's a program in a nutshell. How about we pre-identify them? How about we pick those people ahead of time and we get them some training and some tools so that they, when they get there on event day, instead of dying for our kids, how about they live for our kids? Is that not a better message to teach your kids? How about they win for our kids? How about they end the violence before the next kid dies? And then how about they use the medical skills and start treating the injured so that they don't bleed out and die? Is that controversial? Well, now that we put it like that, 
And that's how you bridge the gap between conservative, God-caring guys and touchy-feeling liberals. Because everybody wants their kids. It's really simple. This is not about guns. It's about safety. I don't care if you hate fire extinguishers because somebody you know got their head bashed in with one. We're not going to pull the fire extinguishers out of the schools because somebody hates them. They're in there because they save the lives of the kids. We need to do the same thing with guns. I don't care whether you love or hate guns. We are going to do what is best for the safety of the kids. So, the training is the mindset. You've got to understand the problem. Real quick history on active killers. In, in modern times, the, the biggest one actually school killing in our country was in Bath, Michigan. It's a bombing, not a shooting. So people don't remember it happened about 90 years ago. But Austin, Texas, the tower shooting really changed law enforcement because they didn't have tools to deal with it. They've got revolvers, he's got a rifle. Thankfully, it's in Texas, a bunch of deer hunters also have rifles. They kept things pinned down. The civilians really played an active role in that. It ended when a civilian, and uh, I forget, it was like one civilian and two cops were the other way around, went up the tower and got the guy. That's, that's how that thing ended. Civilians were involved in every way that law enforcement changed. They're like, hey, we need some special weapons and tactics to deal with this nonsense. Special weapons and tactics, SWAT. That event, I think, is where that SWAT was born out of LA. Looked at that, did it. So then SWAT was going to handle these. We have to call them by. We call SWAT. Any SWAT guys in here? What's SWAT stand for? Really? <laughs> sit, yeah, sit, wait, and talk. Just kidding. No, no, they're awesome. They, but that's what they did at Columbine, right? They sat outside. Understand what those guys did at Columbine. Any team in the country would have done the exact same thing because we didn't understand the event yet. We didn't know what was going on. It's a hostage barricade in your mind, so they treated it as a hostage barricade instead of a mass killing because we hadn't defined what was going on yet. So no fault to those officers who did that. But out of that event, we learned, hey, this didn't work. So law enforcement changed again. They went to the SWAT guys and said, what do we do? And the SWAT guys are team guys. And they said, well, we should train all our officers for teams. So some call it a wedge or a diamond or a, a, a quad. We train our officers across the country to go do this because then we don't have to wait 45 minutes for SWAT. And what we realized several years later is they haven't stopped a single one. Doesn't work. Solo officer response. Ron Bush coined the term uh, "solo single officer saving uh, single officer life saving others." First guy goes in alone. Law enforcement do not go into your house on domestic violence for some woman in the middle of the night alone because it's dangerous. And now somebody's telling you you're going to go in against an active killer with multiple guns and rifles and all this other stuff alone. Why? Because time is all that matters. The logo on my shirt and for faster includes that stopwatch, and that's a nod to Ron Borsch. The stopwatch is that because he coined it, because he studied active killings and, and found, look, here's what we have. Magazine capacity doesn't matter. Type of weapon doesn't matter. All the caliber, all this other stuff people talk about doesn't matter. You want to know how many people are going to kill? Tell me how long you're going to let him kill them. Dr. Eric Dietz of Purdue jokes that Professor Duh, he did computer modeling. What he proved was the longer you let someone kill all the kids, the more of the kids they're going to kill. The faster you stop them, the less. Duh. But that's the thing so few people realize. That's my bracelet. Time is all that matters. I wear this all the time everywhere I go when I take off. It's just a constant reminder that an act of killing, that is what matters. And that is why waiting on outside help doesn't work. 
So our law enforcement's changed a bunch of times. Every time things happen, they fell on back to community as well. We talked about tourniquets earlier. How many people in this room that were taught and put on a tourniquet and lose a limb? Come on, I know everybody in here was taught how tourniquets were taught that. Right? When I was in school, you teachers out there taught me Udo's knife plan. Taught me there's electric volcanoes in War 48. Guess what? College changes, right? You do not lose your limb when you put a tourniquet on. It's a myth. Doesn't happen. The, the numbers on it, out of global war on terror, for four hours, there is not one single loss of a limb. Not one. What about nerve damage? Zillow. Nothing. Six to ten hours. No loss of limbs. One to two percent chance of minor nerve damage to single on this that never goes away after ten hours. You're risking nothing to put on a tourniquet. The medical community has changed. The tourniquet is no longer the last line of defense in a bleeding thing. It is the first line of defense in a mass casualty because it stops the bleeding and because you can put it on in 20 seconds, stabilize that patient and start treating the second and then the third and then the fourth and there's no long-term consequences. It's, it's a myth, understand it. I will tell you the other thing, most doctors in this country don't know that. I'm not a doctor, I'm not an EMT, I'm not a paramedic, I've got no training at all in that. How on earth are you gonna take my word over theirs? Because we went to Colonel Grossman who minds that stuff, why? Because he's the best guy in the country and arguably the world of what he's presenting here today. We went to the top of the medical community for that. Most doctors who don't understand this is because this is not what they do. An oncologist works on cancer. An ENT works on that stuff. It, everybody does their medical is a very specialized thing. Unless the doctor is doing trauma, and they have, if they haven't taken continuing that on trauma care, they know what was taught to them a bunch of years ago. Just like you taught me who goes on that plan. Knowledge changes. So I joked with the schools about staff and like, look, so our cops hate failure and they hate people dying on their watch and they keep changing. And our medics have changed reverse what they're teaching because they don't like people dying on their watch. And in the education world, we keep repeating the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And somebody tell me why you would like an educators. If we can define learning, if we can define the root definition of learning as a change in behavior, how come our enlightened educators are the last ones to learn? They're like, hey, he's talking about me. Yeah. It's so hard for them because they're 50 years behind. Everybody else has been changing and evolving. And our education community has not. So this is a shock to them. It's hard, it's difficult, it is way outside their comfort zone. But if we understand the context and the whole goal on this is saving lives, then we can show them how. So, if we're hostile to the gun stuff, then what do we do? We start with none of them. Broad based statistics. If you were shot in World War II on the battlefield, about 25% of the people would die, 75% of the Pretty cool, 75% of women. Today, you get shot anywhere in this country, 90% chance of survival. Why? Because the medical community is so good. Just like everyone else was talking about. It's not, can you think about that? 90% of people shot with guns fight it today in our country. Asterisk, unless they're in a school, or a church, or a shopping mall, a movie theater, an act of killing. Now our death rate is 50%. The death rate of getting shot in a school is double what it was on a battlefield in World War II 60 years ago. It's five times what it is anywhere else in the country. Why? That's a crazy outlier statistic. Why is it so drastically different? Two things are driving that. One, the proximity of the shooter. Most places, especially in the battlefield of World War II, there's some distance between the shooter and the guy getting shot. In the schools, we're just under two feet. The 
If I shoot somebody from two feet away, it is a devastating wound. So, what do we do about that? Think about our school policies. Think about telling our kids to hide under desks. Don't fight back. Think about the violence is always wrong. It is never justified. Think of what we've taught our kids for two generations. Understanding that Virginia Tech, our kids, young adults, college, prime of their life, someone is in a room killing their coworkers. And kids sat in their chair waiting their turn to get shot next. Why? Because that's what we taught them to do. And just like we talked about earlier, under stress, we will do what we were trained to do. We helped that killer kill our kids in Virginia Tech. Because we told them fighting is always wrong. It's a zero tolerance. Folks, we gotta end that. Fighting is not the solution to most problems. Absolutely not. But if somebody comes in to your room, your area, and is killing your fellow man or woman, fighting is not only acceptable, it's demanding. You better do it. One kid at Virginia Tech fought back. Matt McCord, a Roxas kid. He had to come up the side and to the attack. Soaked up eight bullets in his chest. Died, died out from him. Had anybody else stood up and engaged that killer? It might be a totally different situation. But they didn't, they sat there in their chairs like we trained them. So for your educators, think about that policy. Don't help our killers kill our kids. If there's a time and a place for everything, including violence, and it's okay to teach our kids that. The other thing, the other side of that stat, is our medical care. The reason 90% of people survive gunshot wounds in this country, because we're really good at treating them. Unless we're in school, what do we do there? Dangerous. Stay back. I, 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 I'm based in Miami. So I've flown with a couple of people from Parkland. The study's not out yet, so this is not definitive data. But my understanding from multiple law enforcement is of the children who died in Parkland, two of them died from the gunshots. All the others died for lack of medical care. They bled out blood. That's the cause of death is when you get shot. All they had to do was treat them. And those kids would be alive today. It's unfortunately on YouTube, I don't think there's a complete tape, but you can go on YouTube and put in uh, Townville, Jacob Hall, or Townville Elementary. You can hear the 911 call from the school staff at Townville calling 911. A little Jacob Paul was shot on the playground. He shot in the leg of 22. And they're begging for help. And the dispatcher says, they're on their way. They're on their way. They're coming as quickly as they can. Just hold on. They're on their way. The little boy's unconscious. He's turning blue. We're they're begging for help. They're crying, literally. Is this boy's dying in your arms? Jacob Paul's dead. Seven-year-old boy. Instead of a little scar and a full story to tell the rest of his life, the little boy is dead. His family will never ever put the pieces back together again. Because the school staff is putting ADDs pads on that kid. Why are they putting ADD pads on? Because that's what they're training. They got training in AED. I asked people when I played this tape, I'm like, did that child die because the school staff didn't care? They're crying. 
They are obviously torn up. They will do anything they can to save that kid's life. But they don't have the training and they don't have the tools. So there's nothing they can do but hold that little boy. That's it. Ask your schools, do you have tourniquets? Do you have tourniquets? Do you have trauma equipment? Do you have people trained how to use it? If the answer is no, they're behind in safety. There's nothing controversial about that stuff. Federal program has a stop the bleed program. It's, it's very similar to our medical portion. If your school does not have tourniquets, they are behind in safety. Get up. Make them get the training. I joke with them, I'm like, look, if I have a heart attack, what are you going to do? Out of work. You're going to call 911. Thanks, my wife would just appreciate that. What are you going to do? Anything else? Well, yeah, we're going to get that thing off the wall. The AED. Yeah. What happens to them? What would happen if you didn't? What happened if you just dialed 911? Well, we wouldn't do that. Why, why not? Well, because you died. That's why we got the AEDs in the building. I asked them, well, what if you, what if you just dial 911 and do nothing else? Like, usually, finally, the school attorney will go, that's negligence. I go, ooh, there is a dark, scary word. Because negligence means the liability doesn't end with the school. It's to the school board and the superintendent, and it's personal. It's, it's everything. It's, kids in your, it's closing your kids' closets. It's your bank account. You're done. Negligence is horrible. But they would never do that for a heart attack. They all agree on that. Like, hey, what about a food allergy? A kid has anaphylactic shock. Oh, the nurse has got empty things. Cool. They said, well, what would happen if we just dialed 911 and waited for somebody else to come solve that problem? We would never do that. Why not? Because, because they die. We know that. It's why our schools have APDs. It's why our schools have EpiPens. And if you didn't use the EpiPen and you just sat there and waited for the ambulance to get there and the kid's dead, it's negligence. Like, folks, so somebody comes into your school and starts shooting the kids, and your policy is to dial 911. And sit around and wait for somebody else to come solve your problem? What do you call that? How is that not negligence? How is it any different? The same thing in all of these are something bad has happened. We need some professional help. But if we don't do something, they're going to die. And we know it. You cannot get the ambulance guys in your building fast enough to save somebody who's had a heart attack. If the heart is stopped, you need the AED to restart it. If it's an anaphylactic shock, you have got to get epinephrine in that body. They will not live long enough to get an ambulance in. And if somebody is in the room killing people with a gun, they will not live long enough to get our cops in the building to help you out. It's not possible to do. It's not the cops' fault. We're asking them to do something that is not possible for them to do. They will do everything they can to get there as fast as they can. But the timeline of the event does not allow them to get in your building in time enough to save your lives. The schools have to do it. It is absolutely their responsibility. Because otherwise, we're in negligence. It's not getting sued to be afraid of, it's being successfully sued. This is how we avoid it. We get the training in there. So, I sometimes talk with them on, like, yeah, but this is not our job. This is a law enforcement job. Like, I beg to differ. Think about this for your schools. You're care and custody of the child. You have a legal and moral obligation to care for those in your custody. So, let's talk about, you get a kid, he's a great kid, he's a, uh, He's got lots of friends, he gets good grades, and it's wonderful. But mom and dad go through a divorce, and mom gets a new boyfriend. And then the kid becomes withdrawn, and the grades start suffering. He starts bullying, acting out, totally changing behavior. Then you see Ligature Marks. School 
be more cringy because now we're in more peace. Like, hey, it's not going out of your schools. It's, it's at home. So it's not your problem, right? Your school staff, huh? It is your problem, isn't it? I'm like, so you got to report that within 30 days? Immediately. Yeah, in every state I mean, that I know of, it's immediate. What if you don't? We have to. I mean, it's criminal charges. You know, it's a big deal. I'm like, for, for abuse that's not even happening on your property? You've got laws about that? Man. So, folks, let me submit to you. Somebody comes into your school with a gun and starts shooting your children in your classroom? That is an extreme form of abuse. And there's no asterisk that says, I mean, you got to get protected against from abuse unless it's happening in the classroom, unless it's happening from a gunman, unless they're shooting them. I'm not an attorney, I cannot give legal advice. But every school board attorney that I've talked to on this, that says, hey, I ain't never looked at it like that. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm not an attorney. Here's my card, here's my phone number, my email address. You look it up, you call me and tell me if I'm wrong. This is absolutely your legal and moral obligation to do it, and it's codified in the law. Never one has called me and said, I found a way out. I found an exception for us. It is the school's responsibility. Nothing exceptions for that. When I signed for an airplane, it is my duty to care for the plane, my crew, my passengers, and my cargo. Legally and morally, I have to do that. If I have an engine failure, it doesn't get me out of that. If I have balance to it, doesn't get me out of that. There's nothing on earth that gets me out of that obligation. It is my obligation as the captain of the airplane, and I take it seriously. And our schools need to understand it is their obligation. And they need to take it seriously. And it's not that they don't take it seriously, it's just that they've never thought about this because we keep telling them it's somebody else's problem. It's not. Somebody explain to me how it's not somebody else's problem. It's your problem. The only way to get to it, deny it. Deny it. It won't happen. It's not our job, it's not somebody else's, that's somebody else's problem, that's somebody else's job. If that's what they think, that's fine. But they gotta go find a new job. If your job is to care and custody of other human beings, then you better take that job seriously. And if not, you better find somebody else to do that job that takes the safety of kids seriously. I gotta point out to schools, well, okay. If you're behind in sports, you're gonna hear about it. Parents don't like that. If you're behind in your graduation day, you're gonna hear about it. If you're not getting, if your kids aren't getting scholarships, you're gonna hear about it. If you're behind, safety is not the most important thing, it's the all important thing. Because Every other good thing our schools do, and there's a lot of them, but every other good thing they do, every project that everyone has ever worked on, doesn't matter anymore to the families of the dead kids. It's not the most important thing, it's the all important thing. It's the one thing that destroys every other thing you've ever done in your entire life. We need to get engaged in this. So, how on earth can it work? We go back to picking those key people. The keys to this program are two. Number one, you have to have the right people. Without the right people, this can't work. That's the school's job. They gotta pick the right people. They know their people better than we do. So you pick the right people. Occasionally they'll send people to us that they think are the right people that are the right people. We have people self-select out of classes. And we sometimes have people that we meet at the end, we're like, eh, are you sure you want to do this? And they're like, you know, this is a lot different than what I thought. This isn't for me. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. 
The second key is you've got to have the right training. You have got to have good training. So law enforcement, their, their hit rate, does anybody know what law enforcement hit rate is in a shooting? What? What? 19, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm 20. That's actually high on some space. It, it varies depending a lot on what department we're at. But we'll, we'll use 20% for the national average. So think about that. 80% of their shots miss their targets. Think about a classroom. Think about a parking lot, a school, a football game. Think about the cafeteria. Think about an 80% miss rate. Not acceptable. Cannot happen. As we tell school staff, if you have to get your gun out because someone is shooting kids in your classroom and you have to shoot the killer down, you are having the worst day of your life. Yeah? Don't for a second forget that it can start getting a whole lot worse. If you start helping them kill the kids, it just got a lot worse. Misses are not acceptable. So the training has got to emphasize that. I deal with legislators. We want to copy law enforcement training for our school staff. And one, one told me, I'm like, you don't want to do that. Because why? That was a big selling point. That's how we passed it. I'm like, that. why? Because there's people are, look, we don't want these people, you know, cops screw this stuff up. We don't want to give the, you know, the teachers less training. He said, well, it's the same training we give our cops. And it got support. They all passed it. I said, so what you're telling me is, the cops screwed it all up, so you copied that parad paradigm. You copied a failed thing to hand in the schools. And I was like, well, I didn't think about that. I go, think about this. Your teachers ain't cops. They're not going to be cops. We don't want to make them cops. Cops are really good at what they do on a daily basis. They're really good at traffic accidents. Because of our society, we're really good at domestic violence. They get to see lots of drugs and gangs, but they don't see a lot of active killers. They deal with criminals. And our active killer is a very different type of person. They almost all pass a background check. They're not criminals. A criminal thinks and works very differently than our active killer. I might rob her, not because I like robbing her. I have a drug addiction. And I just have to rob her so that I can get money from her to buy it from her. There's a means to an end. It's not that I enjoy robbing. I just need to get out right now and she's convenient. That's my job. Your active killer, the killing is the end. This is the, this is the, the plan. It's not a means to anything. It's the culmination of things for them. So you're dealing with a different person committing a different crime for a different reason. And on the school staff side, you have a very different person responding to a very specific event. So why would we not give them training designed for them for that event? Legislators usually go, wow, we don't look at it like that. I'm like, yeah, because they never talk to anybody who understands the event. Think about who you're training and think about what you're training them to do. People tell you, you know, active killings, how on earth can we sort this out? Active killing is the most chaotic thing in the world. How do you know the good guy from the bad guy? Anybody who tells you that doesn't have any idea what's going on in active killing. None. I mean, think about this. If we're sitting in a room and they're screaming and somebody walks in the back door and I am going, bang! 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 And you're doing, running around or whatever you're doing, is it really that hard to pick me out of this crowd? I mean, seriously. An act of killing is the simplest dang thing in the world to solve. It really is. They stand out like a sore thumb. Thousands of force on force uh, stuff back it up. The videos of it back it up. But the other thing to keep in mind on training 
reason I did this, and your feelings are not the only reason it goes to school. Maybe I had to kill him because he stole my girlfriend. So I'm going to kill him and then commit suicide. Maybe she's a good person and doesn't want anybody else to get hurt. She picks the gun up. And then you walk in the room. Things can get really complicated. The majority of times the school, a gun is in a school building, somebody's not, we're not dealing with mass killing. We're dealing with a kid who found a gun on the way to school. We're dealing with a kid who's afraid of something. The only kid who just brought in to show off because he's stupid. The kid doesn't need to get shot. We need to talk to him and deal with the situation. But shooting is not the answer to every time there's a gun. So if people say, focus on the gun. No, that's the totality of the situation. That's how you're going to be judged. That's what the training needs to take into account. Our program does not replace law enforcement any more than an AED replaces a doctor. You're going to have to have law enforcement. You're going to have to have them. Our training doesn't make so many law enforcement. We don't get them into law enforcement training because you can't do it three days. But in three days, we can take somebody who's already a proficient shooter and teach them how to solve this problem reliably. We've got another level two class that builds on that. And then we've got a level three class where we go into schools and train them. So it is, it is really neat. It's, it's, it's the coolest thing in the world. But it starts with the mindset. It starts with the understanding. And it starts with the commitment that we need to take a step back and look at what we're doing in our schools. And we need to at least start making some progress. We need to start at, at, at least some medical school skills and tools in our skills. We need to think about security and understand it can happen here. Especially in nice districts. They're nice districts all the time. Hey, we live in a really nice area. We're a very low crime. We have a beautiful community. We don't have that sort of crime here. Like, folks, have you ever been to Linton? Have you ever been to Sandy Hook? Have you ever been to Parkland? Or Red Lake, Minnesota? It looks a lot like Scottsdale. The affluent suburbs. Suburbs, and especially in Portland, where we, where we get these crimes. The well to be nice areas. Inner city schools have problems, no doubt about it. But they don't have active killings. Why? Those kids fight back. <laughs> they do. Those kids fight. And some of them are probably carrying guns. Why do you go to an elementary school and kill a bunch of seven, six and seven year old children? Why would you go to an elementary school and kill a bunch of kids you've never met? Yeah, because those kids in high school are big and scary. They might hurt me. But even I can take care of those seven year olds, especially with my gun. That's the kind of power we're dealing with. That is the level, you can't find a better definition of a power than an active killer. I mean, that's who they are. They perceive themselves as victims. Today they're going to be the victimizer. They're going to make you feel how it, how it feels. And the other thing school staff has to understand, if we're God, then we can just take away every gun. And we can take away the thought of guns so that no one can ever think or invent one in the future. You still have a stop Sandy Hook. You're dealing with an individual who violated the, the two most sacred covenants in our society. He murdered his own mother. And then he went and slaughtered a bunch of innocent children. That individual is going to make you feel his pain. If there's no guns, he'll drive a truck through the window. He'll douse with gas and toss a fire. He'll go and drive a truck through the window. Man, you think anybody's ever going to think of that? 
Like Booty's Cafeteria, it's not even an original idea, folks. Do I think it's going to happen again? Yes, I do. Fire is a weapon that's been used all around the world. It is horrible. You don't deal with burn or pick those. It's, it is horrible. And if the bombs and the fires and the best land were an accident the first time, we learned a lot from it. As Dave says, our plans are evolved. If you look at the Columbine videos and watch them, they are very nonchalant. They literally set their gun down, take a sip of pop, set it down, pick the gun up, and go around and get more people killed. It's that nonchalant. As you look at stuff 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the killers have progressed. Has anybody in here seen the, uh, the video from the, uh, New Zealand killing a couple months ago? A company killer has evolved a long way. He's trained. He knows what he's doing with that gun. His tactics suck. It would have been easy for anybody with some basic training to whack that guy. Now he knows what he's doing with the gun, he's having malfunctions, and he's clear of it. But while he's doing it, he's completely vulnerable. He's, he doesn't move the cover, he stands in the middle. But the killer absolutely is evolving. When you study it, it's very easy to see. If we are not evolving faster than our killers, or follow further and further behind. We need to be working harder than they are. We need to be training more than they are. We need to be evolving faster than they are if we want to stay ahead of them, if we want to keep our kids safe. It is the only way we can do this that we know how. So, for you guys, get involved in your schools, make a difference. Uh, get all the day cop. He has come out to the training and seen it, so he can, he can talk to you guys firsthand on what the training is. Because it's, he, he doesn't have to tell you what I told him. He can give you his experiences on it. My business cards and brochures are up here. That's my cell phone number on there. My, my schedule is completely random. Days of the week, or hours of the day, days of the week, nothing to me. You can call me 24 7 or whatever. You're as likely to wake me up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon as you're at 4 o'clock in the morning. If I'm asleep and you're out of the country and it's going to voicemail, I'll come back. Let me know what I can do to help you. If you got, you can give my number to anybody in law enforcement or schools that want to learn about this and help us. Our website, fastersavelives.org, is, uh, is a resource. Use it. Uh, Faster Save Lives. Next weekend at this hotel, um, I will be back again for the Gun Rights Policy Conference. Uh, so I'll be here talking, not on faster, but I, I will be here uh, unavailable if somebody wants to uh, chat. We've got, for those of you who want to bring somebody out, I'm happy to talk with them. Laura Connor Cardo from Colorado will be talking about what they're doing in, in, uh, on this program. Jeff Staggs is a school superintendent who's had more staff in his schools for seven years. He will be here talking about that and will be available to answer questions, talk to the superintendents. So, use this as a resource. Let us know what we can do. The other thing is, the, the big thing lacking here is funding. Work with your local businesses or individuals and, and get the schools that want to do this and, and put together critical mass to do a class. I will tell you, one class is just like a seed. It'll be a little thing and it'll grow a little plant. But as you give it time, it will sprout. What we've seen in Ohio is district after district after district. I can't tell you how many times districts have told me seven years ago, we are never doing that. Have a kid bring a gun to school and call the cops and give me three minutes every time. Don't worry about it. We'll always solve it. Or maybe it's a parent in a custody dispute that is very angry and screaming, if you don't give me my kid now, I'm going to go and take him. And they're scared. And it turns out, cops can't wait to get there in three minutes. 
And so now they realize, wow, this parent had turned, grabbed a gun instead of just yelling. Had it gone violent and we were afraid it was going to go, we had nothing. And they call us back up and go, can we take another look at this? Like, yeah, sure. The, uh, the one other thing I'll, I'll leave you with this, we had a woman, one of my newest stories through the class, this lady goes through the class, and we talk about, one of the things we talk about is in the movies, when the bad guy gets his comeuppance, we cheer. Because he, he has it coming. There's spooky music, he's ugly, we built the whole movie into a whole scene, and we applaud, because it's cool. And the way it's going to be in the classroom. This may be a kid who should be down. This may be a kid that was in your classroom. This may be a kid that comes from a troubled home, who's got a screwed up home life, who you are the first one who took time to care for this kid. And you spent extra time and saw potential in this kid, and you worked with this kid, and you loved this kid. And you know what? For the year that kid was in your class, you turned that kid around, and you're very proud of that. But now, it's some number of years later, things are back off the tracks again. And he's come back to your class because he didn't do enough of whatever his justification is. Can you shoot down the kid you love? This lady came up and said, Now, his name was, I can't remember the kid's name. She had a specific kid. She's like, You described exactly where I'm at. That would be the worst thing. I could never do that. I'm really sorry I wasted your time. I'm like, you waste the time. Do you like the training? I love the training. It's the most passionate class ever took. I just can't do it. I said, well, can you use the medical stuff we did last night to save people's lives? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. I'm like, cool. Then it was worth you being here. You have learned something to help and save lives. She goes, yeah, but I can't do this other stuff. I said, well, can you use the tactics we taught? Instead of using them to, t to track the floor down and engage him, can you use those same tactics to clear a hallway and evacuate the kids out to safety? She goes, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I'm like, there's lots of ways to use this stuff. I go, come back tomorrow. If you're liking this, come back in the third day. She's like, well, why? I can't do this. I said, because you'll see all the pieces fit together in the force on force training is what we do on day three. So she came back, she did get on the force on force. She said, wow, I'm really glad we had to do this. Now I understand how all the pieces fit together. The whole thing makes sense to me. I'm just sorry I can't do it. I'm like, hey, that's no problem. I enjoy meeting you. What's really important is that you know your ability and that you know your role in this team. She called me a week later. And she said, you know, I haven't slept well for a week. She goes, this whole situation has just haunted me. And what I've realized is shooting that kid down would be horrible, but it ain't the worst thing. She goes, the worst thing would be to watch him kill every other kid in my classroom and do nothing. That's what I can't live with. Can I get back into the program? She said, yes. She's back in. Understand, for people who don't carry guns, they've got to go through that evolution. All of us who carry a gun have gone through it. We did it a long time ago. Maybe we did it over years. But everybody who's doing this has to go through that evolution and, and come to the realization, yeah, this is serious, and yes, I can do it. I'm willing to learn and put in the training and, and, and own this. Like we tell in class, we're not looking for you to learn a skill. This is not about a three-day class and a skill set and checking boxes. This is a change in lifestyle. I want you to be a different person than you came in. I want you to be changed and committed that you are going to spend the rest of your life protecting those kids. And you will do anything and you will train like their life depends on it, because it does. That's who we want this program. You've got to have the right people, and you've got to have the right training. So, I, I thank you very much for being here today, for coming to hear Grossman.
go home, take this information, and, uh, and work on it. Make things better. Own your area. And the other thing I'll say is, is if, you're, if you're in an area where your school just will not deal with it, don't beat your head against the wall. Present the information there, be polite, be positive, that little pressure. At some point in the future, that window will open. When it does, be there to step through and help them with this. But start with the medical and make little steps to make progress. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? Thanks. Be safe. Thank you so much again, Jim. That was unbelievably awesome. Thank you so much to everyone for being here today. I know it's been a long day. I'm just going to wrap up very, very quickly and just say that if anybody came and needed a certificate for work, please see Kim Bishop there at the back. She's got her hand raised. Um, and also, just that we all now bear the responsibility for this information. And we bear the responsibility to take action on this information. And I encourage each and every one of you to think about it, pray on it, whatever the case may be. And then please reach back out to us. Reach out to Dave Kopp, the president of our AZCEL Foundation. You can reach him at president at azcel.org. And unless Dave has some final comments, very good, then we can break for today. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you.